You are listening to part two of our two-part symposium with Teal Scott. Sky Blue Symposia. I'm Gemini, and we are welcoming Teal Scott, author of The Sculptor in the Sky, with us this evening. Teal is a spiritual catalyst, both accepting and utilizing her clairvoyant, clairsentient, and clairaudient abilities. She manipulates electromagnetic fields and has the ability to communicate with thought forms and reminds people of the united energetic nature of this universe. She teaches others how to create and find bliss in the midst of even the most extreme circumstances. You can learn more about Teal Scott at thespiritualcatalyst.com. Teal, we're going to move on to our next topic of the physical body and illnesses, and Bridge has the next question. Teal, do beings ever choose to merge and be born in a single body for a lifetime? And if so, are they Geminis? (laughs) Sometimes Geminis, yes, but not necessarily. Geminis like to, a person who comes into the planetary aspect of Gemini is working with polarity more so than any other being, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're born into more than one body, or more beings rather born into one body. Do beings choose to merge and be born in a single body? Hell yes, that happens. It happens quite often when it comes to spiritual teachers especially. Anybody who is teaching universal information is usually a symbiosis of multiple consciousness streams. So, while it is not super, super common, it sure does happen, yes. Okay, cool. Sabelle has the next question. If someone's a vibrational match for confusion, pain, and struggle, and they're stuck, how do they get unstuck? They get unstuck by distracting themselves first. Most people who are in that type of a place focus negatively on such a regular basis that they need to learn how to stop focusing on things. So meditation is actually one of the best ways to get somebody out of that mentality. Because meditation, when you are meditating, you're trying to stop thought. That's what we want to do for anybody who's who's stuck, basically. Stop thought. So we're either doing that with meditation or we're doing it by putting on a video, anything that, that distracts the attention away from negative thoughts. And by virtue of that distraction, you're going to feel your emotions raise. It's sort of like a buoy. If you pull a buoy underwater, then in that resistance, you can keep it underwater. But the minute that you let go, which we could call distracting ourselves or not holding a thought, that buoy immediately raises to the surface of the water. So you're going to feel your your vibration raising just by virtue of distracting yourself. Then it's time to call into play your emotional guidance system and choose thoughts that feel better to think and things that feel better to focus on. So that's the time to do your deliberate focus work, things like affirmations, things like positive aspects journals, things like gratitude journals. Yeah, because I think, you know, that the aspect of confusion makes it hard to discern sometimes what to focus on or even what to distract yourself with. And (laughs) it can be kind of paralyzing and, and, you know, people may call that, you know, dark night of the soul. This is the whole problem is it's it's so a person-to-person basis Mm because when we're talking about confusion in general, We could be talking about multiple different states. You could talk about somebody who's in a state of dementia. You could talk about somebody who's just feeling frustrated because they feel torn between two opposites. And the answer to this question about what to do with someone's vibration is going to be different based on what circumstance they are in. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it sounds like the, the basic guideline of distract yourself from the negative and move on to the positive. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I sound, I sound so sort of. Fruit Loopy. <laughs> no, it, no, I you, don't think so. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's very clear, and that's lovely. Much easier said than done in the moment, I think. 
it's just it's quite funny when I listen to myself talk because right here when we're talking about being deliberate about your focus there's nothing fruit loopy or woo woo about it but it sure as hell does sound like that if you're in pain or confused just distract yourself and focus positively it's the answer that everyone hates when they're in a negative emotional space (laughs) doesn't that have to do with something with the the social traditions set in place by whatever, you know, by repeated activities that externalize happiness, that externalize that, that wholeness? 100%. That, that is the reason that this sounds woo-woo is because we think that thought is woo-woo. We don't understand the power of the mind. We don't understand that everything you are looking at is nothing but a thought which is physically focused. That's all it is. So if we don't understand that about the thought, then thoughts do seem rather woo-woo. But if we understand that it is the deck of cards that is building this house that we are looking at, then obviously there is nothing that is cracker about saying that you should distract yourself and focus on literally anything that feels good to look at. Are you guys done? Yeah. With yes. Follow-ups. Okay. Um, in your uh, Houston workshop, you talked about um, women, the anger surrounding the menstrual cycle, and I was curious if women stopped resisting their menstrual cycles, would a lot of those resentments and emotional triggers go away? Oh yes, a lot of them would go away, and even more of them would come up because. The blessing of love, and if you're whether that love is focused towards somebody else or whether it's focused on yourself and your own menstrual cycle, love does one thing and very well. It transforms every other vibration that is unlike itself, which is why so often when we find the spiritual path or when we find ourselves in alignment, even more stuff flushes to the surface that needs to be dealt with. More vibrations come up that are meant to be released so that we can find even further alignment. So what you'd watch if people were able to resist their menstrual cycles is that not only would a lot of these triggers and resentments dissipate, but also a great many more that are buried and suppressed would come to the surface in order to be dealt with. Oh, I've got a lot of resisting to um, get rid of them. Um, As far as the way the brain works, you mentioned that dementia is is caused by walled-off memories. Is that true of other brain disorders like epilepsy? It's true of a lot of disorders, yes. The brain, when we've got issues with the brain, what we're dealing with is a disconnection with our eternal aspect, ourselves. So if we're in rejection of any aspect of ourselves, that's going to manifest as a brain issue. This is why more people that have brain there's this, the study's never been done, but I want somebody out there to do it just by virtue of the fact that I can tell you this from non-physical perspective. Um, there are more people with brain cancer who are atheist than anything else. Brain issues arise as a result of being disconnected with yourself in some way. So we could call that self-repression, repression repression of memories of ourselves in the past, repression of feelings. Any kind of self-denial is going to manifest in brain disorders. And it manifests in a great many of them. Epilepsy are, is usually a disorder which belongs to people that are the greatest emotional suppressors of all time. So the emotional system is talking. We're not listening to it. We're continuing to suppress emotion. And that emotion is energy, and it must go somewhere. And so it begins to manifest itself through the body in things like seizures. When you watch somebody have a seizure, it's quite amazing energetically. It's like somebody emitting a light all kinds of energy just continues to go out and out and out, and it's projected kind of like a a supernova from the person who's having a seizure. So that's where (laughs) epilepsy comes from. So how would you go about digging up those repressed either emotions or memories? This is the easy part about shadow work, is that you don't really have to go looking for it as much as most people think, because if you just pay attention to your external reality, you'd know what it is that you're doing internally. It's just that most of us don't take that type of approach to our external reality. We don't say, oh, look, this person is treating me in this way. What does that mean about me? We don't reverse statements back on ourselves, and so we can see how it's more true that we're doing that to ourselves. If we were able to do that, then we'd have there would be no question. We wouldn't have to go looking for what's causing our, our issues. And so the- most, most of us are just so, so not aware of ourselves. We're not aware of our 
emotional guidance systems. We've been taught not to pay attention to them, and so we don't know what to do with emotion when they arise. And so most people say, well, I just don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, well, if you paid attention to the way you feel, you would know what is wrong. It's just that we've been trained not to. So step one is you come back into connection with paying very close attention to what your emotions are telling you. Once you feel an emotion, you chase the thought which, which preceded that emotion. And once you identify that thought, you have the culprit. You have now in your clutches the exact reason why you are feeling the way you're feeling. You have the precursor to all of these physical and emotional ailments that you're experiencing. So the more you you work with those and, and keep turning that question around and looking at it, the better you'll become or the healthier you'll become. Oh, yes, 100%. And then you can't be a match to the symptom. See, anytime we're looking at... We're, humans are a little bit too focused on symptoms, as if they are the disease themselves when they aren't. They're just the red flags indicating some sort of a dis-ease. And even look at the word dis-ease. Ease, allowing, moving in the direction of what is wanted. Dis-ease is resisting, moving in the opposite direction of what is wanted. So you've got some kind of resistance present in the thought patterns of a person who has manifested any kind of symptom like epilepsy or like dementia. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Teal, you mentioned in one of your um, teachings that you're going to be working on a new healing modality. Are you able to discuss that a little bit? (laughs) Well, by virtue of what I'm able to visually see being an extrasensory, I feel as if it's really important to put together a type of healing modality that I can train people in that is in accordance with what I've been seeing. Because a lot of what we teach people energetically and a lot of what we teach people, period, in the Western medical field is not accurate to the way that the body works. And I would like to empower people to know how to work with energy and to understand that there is not a single person on this planet that cannot work with energy. That is the most important thing. See, we we like to say, oh, an energy worker, they've got this amazing talent without realizing that all of us have that talent. Some of us may be more in alignment with it than others, the same way that somebody, you know, might be born and instantly be playing the piano at age four. But it's not like all of us can't learn the piano. Any one of us that wanted to could. And so it works the same way with energy work. We've all got this amazing connection to the non-physical aspect of ourselves and we could help ourselves and all kinds of people just based on coming into this one type of modality. And I feel like it needs to be accepted more in the mainstream, which is something that I'm going to go after, of course. Yeah, it's definitely needed in the mainstream. Absolutely. It it is if we don't have enough reason to do it. I love that where it's sort of like, how bad does it have to get before we're pushed to this? Because our, our healthcare deficit right now is so incredibly insane that something's going to have to happen. You know, we're going to have to stop ignoring the placebo effect like we have been and stop undermining it and saying, oh, it's just that sort of woo-woo thing which we can't really explain. And almost like it's an embarrassment. Oh, placebo, that's just placebo. We need to stop with that type of attitude and start studying what the hell the placebo actually is. Because, you know, the placebo, which is mind over matter, heals more than any other type of treatment. So in the Western medical field, what we do very well is emergency medicine. There's no question there. If you've manifested a broken bone, they do really good at doing that kind of stuff. It's totally fabulous for sewing someone back together that's been completely reamed in a car accident. But Western medicine fails us completely with regards to understanding what it is that causes us to get so out of alignment that we're a match to those kinds of circumstances, and it's completely out of touch with terminal illness, completely out of touch with chronic illness. It has no answers for any of those conditions. And so we need to start expanding the box that we've got ourselves stuck in. And I think that the more outside the box we get with the the power that the mind plays which right now the Western medical field calls placebo, and the more that we get into energy healing modalities, which is we already understand, science already knows that we are all energy, so if we're addressing the body on an energetic level, not just a physical level, then not only will we get rid of our healthcare deficit issue, but 
we're going to have a hell of a lot healthier society in the process. So my hope is that I can empower people to understand that they have the ability to heal not only themselves but others and to teach them how to do that. That's fantastic. And, you know, the more people that request this, um, I've noticed in some hospitals they are allowing forms of therapeutic massage and hands-on energy work and um, iridology and things like that. So the more people are aware of it, the more they'll request it, and maybe we'll see a shift in that kind of thinking. Well, and wouldn't that be amazing if, if alternative health care was covered on insurance plans? That would be an interesting that day. That would be very interesting. I'll look forward to that day. <laughs> Thank you, Teal. Mm-hmm. Isn't insurance a, a recognition or a, a statement that something is external to you? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, insurance, oh my gosh, such a rough subject. Okay, insurance companies are one of the most, when you look at things vibrationally, one of the most corrupt ideas in history. Yeah. And that is playing out, of course. It's not like that's news to everyone listening right now, but... For some people, having insurance helps them to release resistance, meaning could we line up with health 100% and if we trusted it, never be a match to a negative physical ailment? Yes. But for many of us, if we hold an insurance policy, we can stop worrying about something happening and so we're not focused on it all the time and so we are allowing ourselves to find physical health. So whether you're going to participate in insurance or not should be a matter of is this going to help me release resistance to potential catastrophe? Or is it going to add to my focus on potential catastrophe? Am I going to be super out of alignment every time I get that bill in the mail? That should be what answers our question in terms of whether we participate in the system or not. Dancing on the interface. Always. <laughs> Jill, could you talk about more about the logistics of how you visit so many people and how you're on call all the time and, and actually still function in the physical? So the thing that... Most people who are physically alive today hold the belief that they are a finite being, meaning there is a start and an end to that which is me. But the further you get into the higher frequencies, the further you get into the multiple dimensions in this universe, the less you realize consciousness works like this. You realize that consciousness, energy that goes into you, is unlimited. There is no limit to that which is you. And so once you harbor that belief, you can start utilizing the energy in the universe. Do you see how if you think that you're a finite being and you think that there's a finite resource there in terms of energy for you to work with, then suddenly there is. You've limited yourself to your experience. But once you open your mind to the idea that potentially you are just a stream of consciousness, a consciousness that is without boundaries, that is absolutely infinite, you cannot tap it, you can't take away from it, then you have a, you're a match to the understanding in this universe that when you focus your attention somewhere, you can ask for energy to fill in the focus which you just lent out. So essentially the way that I'm able to be on call 24 hours a day for people is that I understand that when somebody calls my energy elsewhere, my energy isn't leaving. I'm just calling more energy to replace that energy which I have now lent out. It's sort of like, you can think of this like money. Let's pretend that when you spent money, that money, the same amount was going to just fill in your account immediately by virtue of your intention. And that's what happens with me. I'm able to lend my energy anywhere it wants to go and replace it with the exact same amount that was asked for in terms of somebody wanting my energy to be taken out of me and my physical body. So are you actually actually, um, aware of the conversations that you're having? Oh, yes, quite. (laughs) I'm more aware, of course, when I focus more intently on what I'm doing with a person. I can focus more right here on this conversation. Like right now, I'm in multiple places at once. But I am focused more on this conversation than the other conversations I'm having, so I will retain more memory from this conversation. But that's not to say that I won't retain memory from any of the other conversations or things that I'm doing in the universe. All right, that makes sense. And I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't imagining the conversations that I've been having with you. Oh, well, no, you're not imagining them, but here, I would like to use this opportunity to catch you on something. Okay. You used the word, I just want to make sure that I'm not imagining it, but imagination is your 
root of access to everything. So most of the things which come in through your mind's eye, you would be calling imagination, and we would be calling creation. Okay. So, so we, in general, those of us who are everyone, but those of us especially who are in the spiritual field, need to stop undermining the value of imagination. Because what takes place in the mind does take place in reality. Right. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> this is a fun conversation. I like where this is going today. Did it make sense to you when I was speaking earlier about being able to replace energy immediately? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't okay. have a, I wasn't actually asking about the energetic aspects of it because I already understood that part. It was more the attention aspects of it. Oh, Attention works very much like the physical works. We are only limited in terms of what we can pay attention to when we're in the physical dimension, because we are operating in the physical dimension through a brain. That is not the modality of interaction outside the brain, so you can take note of a multitude of different conversations at one time, you can be in multiple places at one time, and be fully conscious and aware of all of those places simultaneously when you're outside the, the physical dimension. Okay. It's like it's like quantum superposition. Let's put it there. <laughs> Woo! That was... And yeah. there. <laughs> was that kaput? No. The, quantum superimposition. <laughs> actually, that was one of my guides. Oh, gosh. Oh. This happens quite a bit at my house, actually. See, what happens when the, the mood gets amplified, I had... A, a crystal vase that was now sitting on top of the computer stand, basically. And what happens when the energy gets amplified enough is that it starts to feed into whatever the highest resonance field is. And in a room, that's usually crystal or, or electronical equipment. So if we've got electronic equipment or any kind of crystal in the room, they are a superconductor of energy. And if the energy gets vamped enough, then they sort of it affects the physical structure of that thing so quite often the people who live in my house have to deal with glasses shattering on their own and like nothing will bump them they'll literally just explode like this one just did so this is quite common in my house i'm sure that somebody who studied poltergeistic activity would have a super fun time here <laughs> so, so i wish you guys could have just seen that that was so you're fun. accustomed to this <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of like, oh, I need to get... At first, it was really scary. This is part of what's, what landed me in psychologist's office when I was younger, because this would happen when I, my parents were nursing me. I was, you know, like three and six months old, and my mother would just be nursing me, and then the glass that was in the door to my bedroom would just shatter. That would happen quite a bit, and so she started getting really freaked out about what was going on with me. But now I'm so used to it that it's like, oh, now i got to go buy another... Glass, that's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> so does it mean something? Like, is there a message from your guides when that happens, or is it just energy levels? Well, usually it is that they're trying to convey information, and they're doing it with enough focus and enough intensity that they're able to affect the physical dimension. But it's not like the electrical circuits or the crystal glass can maintain their physical structure and maintain the way that they're working and with the intense amount of current that is going through them. It's sort of like setting off an atomic bomb inside of a crystal glass or trying to operate electronic equipment when you've got a high powered magnet around it. So when they're trying to seriously communicate, it's going to affect anything that picks up on electromagnetic fields. That's why they use crystal in, in um, watches. They use quartz crystal and watches for the same reason, because it is such a conductor of energy. So was the message for for you for this conversation? or Yes, was it... <laughs> yes they've been quite loud the entire time I've been in this room. <laughs> well, I had a, a question about um, how the sun affects us a little bit. I, when I work with uh, people who have dementia, mm -hmm. when the sun goes down and it's dark out and I presume they're not getting sun rays, I don't know, um, their behavior changes dramatically. So they might just sit in their chair during the day and then when the sun goes down they become agitated and paranoid and, and they can hit people and argue and 
their personality just changes when the sun goes down and are they more sensitive to the energy from the sun? What do you think is going on? <laughs> well, the energy from the sun sustains life. There's no joke about that. And it's very difficult for any being to be deprived of sunlight and to stay in alignment because even our very sensitive biochemical systems are set according to the clock of our main star, which is in the middle of the solar system, which we're calling the sun. So I would ask a great many more questions, I think. This is the problem. Is just knowing that information is not enough to make a major okay. leap right now in terms of what is going on with them specifically. Yeah, there's a, um, it's, you know, a, a syndrome called uh, sundowners, which is really uh -huh. common in, in dementia patients. Mm -hmm. um, and it could just be, you know, yeah. their brain is, is having issues, or it could actually have something to do with the sun. I, I was just curious. I've actually worked with a great many of the sundowners who are on, you know, old age homes and things like that. But the problem is, is that it's pretty difficult to say what's going on nowadays, because let's say that you take these people who are in old age homes outside quite often you'll slather them up because of the thinness of their skin with all kinds of, you know, chemicals, all kinds of things which prevent sun. So even if they're outside sitting in the sun, and humans need a good deal of sun, they need at least 20 minutes a day of direct sunlight on their skin. But if we're putting sunscreens on, like we, I've never seen somebody take someone who is in an old age home outside without putting it on because of the thinness of their skin. But you can't take them outside and put sunscreen on and have them be absorbing all of the things that they need to absorb from the sunlight. And they're, when you're not absorbing sunlight, your body isn't able to produce the things it produces in response to sunlight. So mm -hmm. what I would do if I had anybody with me who was like that is I would find a way to bring them out, not in the harsh sunlight. So we're looking for sunlight that is like early morning or late night sunlight. And I would take them out and expose as much of their skin as we possibly can to it and no sun glasses because even the sunlight hitting our retinas has a chemical effect on the way that our brain is producing neurotransmitters. So no sunglasses, no sunscreen, and I'd have them go lay out in the sunlight for 20 minutes every day and see if that changed the way that their behavior is because mostly when people freak out when the sun goes down, and it's not a result of trauma that happened when the sun goes down, not a result of subconscious fears and things like that. It's a result of the fact that when they are in the sunlight during the day, they aren't actually absorbing enough for it to transfer. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, yeah. and I like, I, I can work with that. And I had another question about what are the sources you learn from? You know, do you read other teachers? Does it all just come from your own experience with the universe? Well... This is a bit difficult to explain because when you are able to exit the physical dimension, there's no limit to who you can have conversations with. There's no limit to what you can experience and what questions you can ask and have answered. So most of my information comes from going out of body. The rest of it comes from the fact that I'm able to directly channel my higher self aspect, which means that I can open up and have my higher self perspective answer these questions for you if I so choose. And so there's a great deal of learning that happens there. And then that ability is blended in with the fact that I've had my own experiences here. And through that kind of experience, I have learned an even better way to communicate with people. So I feel like the most valuable information that I have to share here is a unity between the source perspective, which is my higher self perspective, which I'm able to readily access at any point woven in with the fact that I've had such traumatic experiences in this physical life. Because it's like I can relate to people in a way that I can communicate to them, but on this, in the same way I can maintain the perspective, given that I can experience the perspective of my higher self that most physical humans don't have access to yet by virtue of holding a lower vibration. So I learn from every person that I interact with. I don't have direct sources that I go to to learn things from, but I, I ask questions 24 hours a day. It's just I'm ascertaining lessons from absolutely every person that I meet because I know what questions to ask relative to every person that I meet. I learn a great deal from my own resistance, too. So it sounds like you're saying questions are as valuable, if not more so, than the answers. 
Well, without the question, the answer wouldn't exist. I think questions are every bit as valuable as the answer. You can't really separate one from the other. Yeah, yeah. There would not be an answer without a question. So, so the person that knows the most is the one that asks the most questions. And the person that's willing to accept the fact that the more questions you ask, the more questions there are to ask. And what do you think of the idea of, I know someone who teaches at a university and it's focused on questions versus answers. So what do you think of the idea of just staying in the question versus seeking the answer? If human beings were capable of just staying in the question, then I would say that it would probably be a fantastic space to be because all the answers would present themselves immediately if you were able to stay in that state. Because you don't ask a question without being able to give rise to the desire for an answer. That's what a question is. A question is a desire for an answer. Mm -hmm. And that's the simplest way to sum it up. So if there's a desire for the answer present, but a person's able to release resistance to not getting the answer answered, then they will allow themselves to flow in the direction of that answer and it will come. So that person would have more answers than anybody else. But becoming okay with being in the space of not knowing, with which we call could call in the space of the question, is a very non-resistant space. They call that being comfortable with groundlessness. And if we're comfortable with groundlessness, then nothing can shake us. And so it's a highly peaceful place to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, this is uh, Brian. I have a question for you about spirit guides. Uh, one of your one of your video seminars, you I asked you about this on this topic, and you discussed how we might contact our spirit guides, and you talked about how we could... Some some people would be sensitive to hearing them. Some people would be sensitive to maybe seeing them or feeling them. But I was wondering if there is a more, and I don't want to say ritual, but a, a certain steps to make that relationship more conscious. My favorite way to have people begin doing it is to begin by... Well, we could make use of something if we want a more ritual way of going about this. We could make use of things which non-physical beings... I guess you could say activate in order to be able to manifest better. So you know how I was speaking earlier about crystal? If you have more crystals in the room, that sounds woo-woo, but actually it amplifies the amount of electromagnetic energy in a room, and so that amplifies their ability to interact with the physical dimension. So I usually have people get crystal of any kind. It could be rocks, it could be wine glasses, anything crystal, and I would have them also simultaneously get water. For whatever reason, water holds a frequency which enables non-physical beings to manifest, which is ironically why in the places, like let's say that you're in a humid location, more like Seattle. If you're in a super humid location, it's higher, much higher likelihood that you're going to be interacting with ghosts, you know, things like thought forms, because of the fact that those, the water droplets in the air enables them to manifest themselves. So I would tell somebody to get crystal and water and to place that around themselves and then when they're in a very quiet space so you can focus to ask you know set forth intention either verbally or mentally set forth the intention to interact with your non-physical guides so just say I want to meet my guides spirit guides and so you want to ask them to identify themselves in terms of a, a feeling this is usually the best way to go about it in, from the get-go, let's just call it this day one. So you sit there and you invite them and you just breathe. And you got to understand the minute you set forth an intention, it is being answered every single time it will be. So you're going to get one of them who's basically, and it's usually your primary guide. You can ask for your primary guide first and ask them to identify themselves. And what you're going to feel is some sort of an emotional or physical sensation. And we could call that their calling card. So this person or this non-physical guide basically is giving you an indication for who they are based on a feeling which you are going to interpret. So it's kind of the same way as like if I was to walk you into a dark room with someone that you knew really well, I could probably ask you who was in the room and you could tell me with reasonable accuracy based on the fact that you're picking up on the way that they feel. And non-physical guides are the same way. So you got to start tuning into the way that the room feels, the way you feel when they are around. So guides have a, if you ask them specifically, most importantly, 
they have a very definitive way of making themselves known, either either virtue by virtue of like an emotional feeling or a sensation. For example, a lot of people have primary guides that mess with one aspect of their body. So a primary guide may come into contact with your um, vascular system and may make it so that your ears flush red. And so your ears flushing red is going to be your indication that your primary guide is in the room. So that will be their calling card. You want to ask for them to identify themselves one by one based on those sensation calling cards. And then you can ask, basically, when you feel as if there's no more coming forth, you can count how many of them came forth. And those are your primary guides, the ones who you usually have one primary, but we call them your primary guides, the ones that are with you all the time. Those are the ones you want to have identify themselves to you. So you can become familiar with the sensation that you get either emotionally or physically when they are in your presence. That's the step one for interacting with them. And I think it's the most important one specifically. So as your as your relationship with those guides are maturing and evolving, what what where are you trying to where are you headed in other words? Are you seeking advice? Are you seeking some sort of spiritual companionship, where where would you want it to go, ideally? I think that changes based on person to person, because some people want them for different reasons than others. My favorite way to interact with them is, like you said, asking questions. I will, especially in my particular business, I'm working with people who have really complex disorders all the time. So quite often I have a rendezvous with them, but you know now it's to the point where... I see, I see them physically, so it makes it a lot easier to communicate with them directly. But I can also exit the body, leave the body, and go have interactions with them in the fourth, fifth dimensions. And I'll have full-on conversations with them where we're all devising a treatment plan for a particular client. So for me, it's all about the co-creation of information, I guess. We co-create what we would all think would be the best route to take relative to myself or relative to a client that's seeing me. And it's that interaction, which I like the most. Some people want them just because they want to feel as if they have support. So it really doesn't matter what you want to learn from them. They are there for whatever you want them to be there for. <laughs> so, so for you, it's pretty easy because you can see the guides, but for someone who's learning this and is getting information, maybe from a spiritual source that, they can't see. How would you distinguish, how would one distinguish between, say, your, a spirit guide and something that may be uh, uh, just a spirit and something maybe that's even unsavory? Your emotions will tell you. You will not be able to experience a, a guide without having positive emotional interaction. So your guides will always resonate with you in a good way. If you're dealing with a thought form, which we're really, this is what we're talking about here in terms of unsavory potentially, which is just a stock thought that is reverberating, which we call ghosts versus guides, you will feel a negative emotion. That is your indication you're not working with a guide. So you would never experience a ghost that was positive but not a guide? Well, you could experience a ghost that was positive but not a guide, but it would have a much different emotional sensation to you. It would feel sort of stuck. It wouldn't vibrate at that same super high level which you would identify a guide with and I realize that this is sort of difficult to talk about in this way instead of to have you in the room with me here and I could I could if you were here with me because I've got multiple ones in the room guides and non-physical thought forms which we call ghosts I could walk you into one and then walk you into the other and you would feel the vibrational difference between them because one of them is more um, it's got vibrations of resistance within it Whereas the guides don't. The guides do not have a, a vibration of resistance. So if so you were to be getting, say, advice from a spirit guide, when would you, and you're listening to advice, when, would there be a red flag with, like, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like something coming from a guide. It some, sounds something different. Is Are there any red flags to look out for? Oh, yes. A great many. But resistance is the number one. So anytime we're dealing with resistance, we're dealing with um, negative patterns. So let's say that somebody who's operating at a very high frequency it does not really care one way or the other what decision you make. So, so a guide could give you advice, but they'd never say, oh, my gosh, get it together, girl. You know? Right, right. So you, you can bet on the fact that your ego is interjecting or that you're dealing with somebody that's not a guide 
when there's an extra amount of human resistance added to the vibration of whatever they're conveying. Their information will be so high vibrational that you will feel as if nothing matters. Not, not nothing matters in a depressed way, but nothing matters as in everything's totally fine. They don't, it's not like they're sitting up there being like, oh my gosh, I'm really concerned. Or, oh my gosh, I'm really frustrated with the decisions you're making. They never have that attitude towards us. So they've always got a super high vibratory um, message to share. Always, always, always. Even if they're warning you about something, it's in the context of we understand that you can choose a different path. So, so there would be a situation yeah. where they're not... Like if someone's giving advice to do something very specific, that wouldn't necessarily be. I guess what I'm just wondering is, so you have this spirit guide and you're on the planet and trying to learn lessons. To what what rules do they are they governed by in terms of what information they can give you in terms of advice? They can give you any kind of advice that they see fit, specific okay. or non-specific. Thank you. The, our, my whole problem here is that people. People's connection to non-physical, the connection to spirit guides, is going to be feeling in nature. And so if we don't trust ourselves, this is sort of the problem. So I'm speaking to you, and we understand that you're a very cerebral person. The problem with being highly cerebral is that it's difficult for cerebral people to get out of the mind enough to get in touch with their heart selves. That's the feeling self. And it's your feeling self which pulls you into connection with all of these types of messages. So you, it's true you may get a direct message, but the way that message feels to you is your indication as to whether you're dealing with a guide or a not so high vibratory being or your own ego, which is why we're having a difficult time explaining exactly how to differentiate between one and the other because there is no cerebral way to differentiate between a guide and a ghost. Just for, from learning out-of-body experience and energy work, I've become become quite sensitive to energy in my own body and and sometimes very sensitive to physical people that are in front of me or I'm yes. interacting with but not so not much so non-physical non <laughs> energy so so what's the difference i'm interested wait why do you because so, like if you're out of body i'm sure you've experienced that where you are interacting with them and it's a full sensation feeling type of experience for you so what do you think causes the separation when you come down here into the physical well, when I'm well, there was one situation, for example, I was at a, a writer's right. conference and I was sitting next to a woman, and yeah. I asked her, you know, what, what do you write? And she she said memoir, and she said she's writing about grief, and I immediately felt this wave of, you know, you know despair and grief, and I I started tearing up and almost crying to that point, uh -huh. and yeah. it comes it turns to find out that she, her her husband died in uh, one of the twin towers in 9/11. Huh? And so now, so, you know, I'm getting I'm, immediate feedback. Okay, well, I know what I'm feeling is real and yes. and validated, uh, as opposed to having a, a feeling or a sensation and not understanding where that's coming from. Yes. Well, that's not much of a connection. That's or a disconnection rather. That's a serious connection. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm asking is, what's the disconnection for you in terms of feeling and non-physical beings like guides and ghosts? I, I think it's just a matter of when I'm in the body trying to um, trust those feelings that are coming in and understanding that they're from a guide and, and then trying to set an intention for that relationship. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, this could be its own whole thing. And now I'm all bummed that you're not in the room with me. I would love to have all kinds of experiments. That would be very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Teal, this is Gemini, and I was wondering if hello. hello. I was wondering if you've ever had the experience of a guide that's uh, been with you for as long as you can remember that has chosen to move on. And I don't know what guides do if they evolve, if they're working on their own things, and then had new guides come in that you've had to adjust to. I've seen it happen a few times. Most often, you'll have a the primary guide, which we're talking about the the one guide that you come down with that you stay with your whole life. That's why you call them a primary, is because no matter what your vibrational fluctuation is, their intention is to stay with you through the totality of it. But it is quite common for you to replace your entourage, meaning separate from that that primary guide, which I've only seen replaced very few times over the course of my life. You the entourage that's with them. 
so your group of guides, anytime you increase your vibration significantly, their expansion is no longer served through you, and so you will get a whole new group of guides. That is quite common. And it's, it's never because they chose to move on because of something you did wrong. It's just because your vibration has changed and now their expansion will be served through helping somebody else. Whereas a new wave of guides will be, their expansion is going to be served through helping you now. And when has been the case that you're aware of when primary guides have decided to change out or move on? that there's the next fun part. <laughs> I have only ever seen it happen when people like get in a huge car accident and die. And what we're looking at is their body and it's a new soul that's walked in okay. to the body. So that's why I sort of did not bring that particular part up is because it's a whole nother can of worms is the fact that, that primary guides have never seen them change except for when the person themselves did change. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Gia, when yeah. you're talking about feeling the emotion or a, feel, a feeling from the guy, is that true over all the different psychic abilities or would like a psychic who just has a knowing have a different kind of sensation? Oh, yeah. The psychic who had a knowing would just know. I mean, feeling is your connection to non-physical, but feeling is kind of a catch-all term. Because people feel in different ways. So you could say that the person who has spiritual intuition, who just knows, feels that sense of knowing. Okay, and each guide would be a different knowing. Yes. Okay, thank you. And so it's sort of the same way. Some people will get the sensations, other people will see the images, and that's the indication that they're in the room. That's why it's a bit difficult to have a conversation like this where we're being so general because everyone interprets this information differently. So one person would get many more visual images relative to guides. Another person would get many more emotional sensations. Another person would get many more physical sensations relative to whatever they're interacting with just because that's the venue which is the most open to non-physical energy. Right. right. I just wanted to check because it sounded like Brian is feeling empathy or empathically oh he's and, definitely empathic for sure <laughs> and so that I wanted, I wanted to make sure that that wasn't how I, I would feel it because I'm not empathic yet not, not very much so being empathic and, and not trusting your own feelings is acute torture I can imagine mm -hmm. that is a very exquisite say phrase that you just uttered <laughs> How so? I perceive the silence. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> no, it's it's. It, it, I consider myself very empathic, and I don't yet have the trust in that. And so I I want to run with it, and yet I hold it back. And so that is very painful. Yes. This is why I suggest to people who are trying to develop these types of techniques, let's say they're empathic, to if they're embarrassed expressing these things to other people to keep a journal where they write down every single impression they get empathically or otherwise and to just close the book and keep it somewhere because that enables people to acknowledge the fact that they're receiving that kind of input from non-physical energy but also they don't get to risk feeling like an idiot by running around saying things which they don't totally trust yet. The reason this is good is because you can prove to yourself how good you are at interpreting non-physical energy because obviously if you write down all these empathic things that are coming in, they will be confirmed in the future and then you can go look back in that book and look through your list and go, oh my gosh, I really am incredible. And at that point it will be much easier to come into the public eye with these types of things and not be ashamed of or doubting these types of talents that you possess. That makes very clear sense. Good. For someone who's empathic, um, how should they deal with the bad feelings that they get from other people who are um, experience sad, experience sadness or going through bad times? Here we go with another can of worms. <laughs> okay, here's the issue. We can interpret what is going on with someone empathically and have those sensations occur without having that extreme feeling of duress. So in the previous example, when he was sitting down by the woman who is feeling what she was feeling, 
the first thing that happened in his body was that he was registering the fact that there was emotional trauma that was going on with this person. But the minute that the emotion started to well up was the minute that he adopted the vibration for himself, meaning he started to adopt the thought patterns that were being offered from that person. And so it was his own thoughts that caused that serious emotional response. So this is where you get into real trouble with empathic ability. All of the modalities of taking in non-physical energy obviously have pluses and minuses. The minus to being a mental intuitive is that you can quite often feel as if you're completely going crazy and feel as if you are psychotic. But the downside to being an empath is that it's very difficult to separate the emotional, and I don't want to call it emotional, the feeling-based messages that you're receiving from non-physical energy and the thoughts which you are now adding to it, which are actually causing your emotional response. So you can register that somebody is in a lot of pain, but when you start feeling that pain yourself, it's because you're thinking thoughts relative to the person or the thing that you're observing. So the way to deal with it is by allowing yourself to receive the information about where a person is, and that will come with very little emotional attachment, even if it comes through the venue which we call emotional intuition, which is the heart center. And you can, you can perceive that without adding to it your thoughts, thoughts like, oh my goodness, this person has a lot of, you know, is suffering. And for most of us, when we think, oh my goodness, this person is suffering, we have already attached meaning to that concept like, and that's not a good thing. So that thought is instantly what brings us into this negative emotional loop where we start becoming the bleeding hearts. A bleeding heart is somebody who is an empath, but who very quickly overlays their own not so positively focused thoughts over the information they're receiving from other people. So the empaths that are the very best are able to receive the information through their heart centers in terms of where people are, but then immediately able to pivot and focus on what that is creating for the person to the positive or focus on some aspect which causes you to feel emotionally good, which means that, that you have now added the highest vibrational state for that person to your own vibrational um, continence, basically. And now you are focused on that and thus lending to that, not only in your life, but in the other person's life. Cool. cool. Thank you. Are you still Are you doing still personal consultations, or have you phased that out with being so busy? I phased it out for the most part, but I've decided that it's having these kinds of conversations, like even what we were just talking about. I could tell that when I when I speak these words, not a lot of people are going to understand what it is that I just said, because it's so specific, based on a circumstance, that I've decided basically to start seeing people in person only, not Skype sessions or phone calls on Mondays. So I'm still accepting those on Mondays if people are willing to come see me in person. And in person and is in Colorado? I'm in Utah. Oh, Utah. Utah. Sorry. <laughs> Teal, I have one Teal. last question for you. I think that might be the last question. I'm not sure. How do your dreams, do if you- at all, factor into the work that you do? Are they a precursor or do you follow your dreams? Oh, that I yes. do? Yes. Well, when I go to sleep, I don't dream unless I consciously dream, meaning that I have to consciously, when I'm out of body, think about interacting deliberately with my dreamscapes, which is just fourth dimensional thoughtscapes. And I do that for the purpose of understanding what I am in alignment with. So rather than use that for my teaching, I use it for my own expansion. Because nothing tells you what vibrational state you're in better than your own thought forms. So it's like, it's what I would use for my own personal alignment. It's kind of like how I check in with how good I'm being about staying in alignment. (laughs) Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That's why I would choose to. It's not like it's particularly enjoyable to me. But the reason that I do it is because it's a super learning tool. That's why I would choose to do it. But there's a great many nights that I choose not to do it. So if you get messages so, through your yeah. dreams, is that like a way that you interact with your guides? Yes. Okay. 
and with other symbolic images of your own subconscious. Your own subconscious will choose to communicate to you through your dreams, and you will interact with the symbolic images of those subconscious messages. Pay more attention to my dreams. Hell yes. (laughs) Can I ask, when you don't choose to dream, and I'm assuming just go into a very deep sleep, um, do you come back from that feeling more uh, aware of more things? I I come back more than not, more often than not, being more aware of the amount of misalignment that I have maintained throughout my day-to-day basis. Because when you come back into body out of dreaming, you're picking up where you left off. But throughout the day, you get acclimated to a certain level of resistance. And then when you release resistance when you go to sleep, you come back into that resistance when you come back into your physical body. And suddenly it feels like like a, a major, you feel the difference you see, between that that non-resistant state and the resistant state, not because you were not in that position before you went to bed. You right. were. It's just that you were used to it before, and now you're not used right. to it by virtue of having released resistance all night. That so, would be why I wake I, up happy most days and then <laughs> go to sleep different than happy. <laughs> wait, wait, explain that to me. You Give me I your wake experience. Up when I, I've noticed... That when I sleep, I rarely, rarely dream. I wake up most of the time in an extremely positive mood and just <laughs> just enjoy. And and then it go, I go through the day and I look at this and I look at that and it, it weighs on me. I I reacclimate to the what you were just talking about. Uh-huh. I, and. I have found when I get to the point where I cannot hold that pain, I go to sleep. And in an hour, it's uh, the joy's back. <laughs> yes, that's, that's actually pretty unique to you. That means that you have an expectation about sleep and the expectation is being delivered to you by virtue of you waking up in a good mood but most people they develop resistance and then they go to bed in an aspect of resistance and when they release resistance at nighttime they're feeling fabulous but when they come back into their body they immediately start off on a negative foot in the morning because it's how they left off yeah no, i so, do a full reset most of the that, time that's super awesome that's very very good news i'll quit I'll worrying quit. about it then <laughs> why were you worried oh i just oh, I, I, I have an extremely active imagination and I go all sorts of places with it. And I am learning to allow that negativity to just kind of blow away in the wind and hold on, (laughs) hold on to the branches that stay. I would have a great many people who would kill to experience the kind of sleep that you're talking about. Oh, I hope they don't have to. (laughs) Teal. This has been such a lovely conversation, and we so enjoy having you on um, Sky Blue Symposia with us. And when you get a chance to come back, we'd love to have you. Okay. And you? Yeah, sure. You can just set that up with Blake if you'd like me back again. I super enjoyed this. Also, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone who's listening understood what I was saying. It's really difficult trying to convey some of the stuff into physical language. So, I think we need to get to one of your seminars. (laughs) <laughs> okay. It is easier when we can bounce off of each other back and forth, and in that bouncing back and forth, we can find a kind of alignment with what information we're trying to convey. It is a bunch easier than doing it in this kind of a forum, for sure. Well, thank you so much for well, being with us. Thank you for having me. This concludes part two of our two-part symposium with Teal Scott. 